everyone. Welcome to Looking Over Baptist Church. We're so glad that you're joining us today on the first Sunday of the Christmas season. I'm so excited. <laughs> We're going to start out today in worship. Turn things over to Pastor Clay. Amen, Emma. That is one of my favorite Christmas songs. I love that song. Um, which, by the way, when I texted you, I didn't mean that song exactly, but I'm glad you did it. <laughs> uh, Good morning. Welcome to Licky River Baptist Church. We're so excited that you're joining with us on our online campus today. If you're visiting with us, I want to be the first to welcome you and let you know that we're so excited that you're joining with us today. Uh, I got a lot of announcements to uh, run through really quickly. Uh, we are, as, as, uh, uh, as Emma said, we are celebrating the Advent season. And so we typically celebrate Advent as the four Sundays before Christmas. Well, your pastor dropped the ball on last week, and so um, we are on week two. Uh, last week, we uh, should have studied um, hope, <laughs> and uh, as, as the week of Advent, we, we've been studying in our devotionals uh, about hope, but uh, as we go through, the lack of technology uh, that we have prevents us from doing candles, uh, but we are... Uh, moving forward, just as that. So this week, as we're coming into this week of Advent, we're looking at love uh, and God's love and incredible love for us. And so uh, I'm excited for it. I know that there's a lot to be said about God's love. There's so much uh, to rejoice in God's love. If you joined us for Sunday school, we talked a little bit about God's love today uh, in the midst of Satan trying to cast discouragement. And I know Many of us are facing uh, just this with COVID and with uh, everything that is trying to uh, take the joy out of our lives. Uh, we need to focus on God's love. Uh, really quickly, hopefully, uh, again, pending our community's caseload, we're monitoring that very closely. But hopefully, next Sunday, December 13th, we look at regathering together. As a body of believers and worshiping together, um, again, we will make that decision a little later in the week, uh, but hopefully we are looking forward to regathering on December 
uh, the 13th. And that being said, ladies, if we do decide to gather, I guess men, you can help too, uh, I want December 12th to decorate the sanctuary. Uh, and so what would traditionally be called the hanging of the greens, uh, we're going to just decorate the sanctuary. And that way on December 13th, when we come in, we are ready uh, to worship in the spirit of the Christmas season. Uh, and it's not all about decorations. We look toward a Savior's birth that truly gives us hope uh, that we should have studied last week. But um, also, as we go into our Christmas uh, season, we come into our time of Lottie Moon, and I'll show a video here in just a minute uh, about our Lottie Moon offering, but our Lottie Moon offering impacts those uh, from the international missions. And so many, if you, if you heard me talk uh, back in the summer, our plan was this fall uh, to have partnered with an international missionary, but because of COVID, because of everything uh, that happened, we didn't get a chance to do that. Uh, because, quite frankly, international missionaries, their lives have been radically and extremely transformed. Many of them have been sent home on furlough. Many of them have uh, struggled in the villages where they are because of, of COVID. Many have been stranded uh, in different countries uh, because of their ministry efforts. And so uh, it is extremely important during this time to remember our international missionaries. And that is exactly why we contribute to the Lottie Moon Mission offering. And so what I would ask for you is that through the month of December, be praying if God would allow you to give. And, and just that when we regather, there will be envelopes there in the back where you can go ahead and grab and you can uh, contribute that way. Or if you just rather, you can contribute uh, through K and just let her know that it's for the uh, Lottie Moon offering. And so um, hopefully as you've been also going through the month of December, uh, you've been following along with our December uh, Devo, and I've lost my booklet. I'm not even going to try to find it. But our December Devo, uh, where we are going through the entire, every day in the month of December, we are reading God's Word. We are encouraged. I hope that your family has been uh, encouraged by that. If you haven't, please go ahead and feel free to join us and begin uh, that today with your family. You can download it on our website, lrbcsalyersville.com. There's a, there's a little button literally there that says December Devo. You click that, it'll take you directly to the page where you can get your, uh, your devotional and your resources there as well. And so uh, please join us as we, uh, uh, as we go through that. The first week's video, each week, or each uh each week has a different theme. Uh, last week's video will premiere tonight at 5 p.m., so be sure you have your family uh, gather around. Jerrica uh, was gracious enough to uh, help us to record that. In fact, you can't even see over here to, to my left, but we have a beautiful Christmassy display uh, over here where we've been filming those devotional videos. And so, um, But be sure at 5 p.m. to go ahead and tune in. Enjoy that with your family, or if you tune in afterwards, you can do that as well. Uh, but enjoy the December Devo with your family. The, the encouragement is because on January 1st, we are beginning a church-wide mission, kind of, uh, to read our Bible daily, to be encouraged in our word daily. And that is going to come uh, through what's called Daily Dose. And it's a podcast through Spotify, Apple, Google, whatever you get your podcasts on, you can go and you can follow us. We are on Spotify and Apple now. You can search Daily Dose by LRBC, or if you just want the sermon audios, you can search Licking River Baptist Church, and we're also on there as well. And so be sure that you go ahead and you go ahead and follow that every single day next year. There will be a podcast released where we read through God's Word together. We're going to read through key passages of God's Word from, from beginning to end. And so hopefully we will challenge ourselves to get through every single day of reading God's Word together. The December Devo is hopefully to prepare your family uh, for this. And so every day you'll gather around together as a family and you can enjoy uh, time and God's Word together. And so um, we're excited about what God is doing. We are expanding in our uh, online ministry efforts in, in, in many ways. Now we have YouTube, Spotify, uh, like I said, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, whatever platform you are looking for Licking River, we should be there. Um, that as well, we also have a website where everything is centrally located, where you can find anything and everything you want, and that is at lrbcsalyersville.com. So uh, as we look forward to, the, to Christmas Eve, um, hopefully we will have it in person. However, if it is not, we will still do a, a Christmas Eve service virtually. 
And so um, hopefully we are able to gather to back together in person and look at that. But I want to be sure that you understand that whether we do or not, we are still going to have a Christmas Eve service where we look forward to the hope that God is going to give us through Christmas. And I love it. So uh, I'm going to pray for us and I'm going to invite Emma back up here. Or I'm sorry, I'm going to invite uh, Jennifer up here for our children's moment. And then I'm going to invite Emma uh, back up here. And so let's pray. Oh, wait, I'm going to show a video, and then we're going to invite Jennifer up here. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for today. and Lord, I just thank you, Father, for the opportunity that we have to just come and worship today. Lord, I pray that, Lord, you'll just help us wherever we're at, Father. We all come, and we're in different campuses right now, Father. We're watching through our phones. We're watching through our computers, Father. Some of us are watching through the TV. Lord, I pray that right now, God, you will just work a mighty work. And then, Lord, you'll just take the distractions of our lives, Father. We all come with distractions. And Lord, right now I pray, God, for the next hour that we might be able to set them aside. Lord, we might be able to set them aside and we might be able to focus on you today. Lord, we might hear you speak. We might hear your words for us today. So Father, Lord, right now I pray that God, as we uh, go into our time of worship, that you'll open our hearts and our minds to just receive the message in which you have for us. And Lord, we just understand that God, you are in control. So Father, we love you and we thank you. We pray all these things in your son Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Jen, go ahead and show that video. Nani ama wai shikuwa na polisi? Nani ama wai kuliwa na chawa? Nani ama wai lala nja kwa street? Nani ama wai durumiwa ki mapenzi? Ama anajua mtu ama wai durumiwa kwa street? Kudurumiwa ki mapenzi? Whenever I was hanging out with the boys, people would come to me and be like, you know, these boys are dangerous. You know, these boys are going to hurt you. You know, you shouldn't be here. And they're just despised by everyone. Only a few understand that these are just normal children who have been forced to the streets with different circumstances. They're not loved. They're actively insulted and abused and kicked. Show them love and they will respond with love. Show them a bad attitude, and they will repel from you. They are just children. In 2009, 2010, I was serving as a photographer with the International Mission Board. And one of my last assignments was a story on a young lady working with street kids in Nairobi, Kenya. I would spend from 4 in the morning to 10 at night with this group of 20 kids, getting to know them, hearing why they were on the streets. And the whole time I was like, oh my gosh, the Lord is going to call somebody to work with these kids. Like somebody needs to come do something. So I finally just said, Lord, are you calling me to go work with those boys? And I had peace. Like I knew that that's what I was being called to do. Hopefully 13 boys will come to the shelter this morning. Um, and they'll be rescued off the streets. Upotari. Honestly, there were so many years that I worked on the streets in Nairobi without a place to take boys. I would just get to know them and help them like in the small ways that I could. Um, And the fact that God has provided the shelter um, and given us opportunity to be rescuing kids off the streets and make a real difference in their life. It's really exciting. Like, life will not be the same for these boys. And Naivasha Children's Shelter, our mission is to rescue them from the streets, to help them to be rehabilitated, to get off drugs, to go through trauma counseling. And as much as we see that these kids need food and they need education and they need a bed to sleep in, they do, they need all of those things. But what they really need is the love of a family. They need to belong somewhere. They need to be well cared for. They need to know that they're loved. And we show them that through the love that the social workers give them here. We show them that by pointing to the love of Christ and we show them that by putting them back in their family where they belong with people who love them. One of our social workers, Elphis, will spend hours looking for one kid that's lost that he wants to be able to have a new life. Um, It's not just Elphis, all of the social workers at the shelter are amazing. They go to the streets every day and every night They get to know the boys, they get to hear their story, know why they came to the streets, know what happened in their family, and offer them a way out. I talk to them, I make them understand that 
despite everything that you're going through, there is hope and there is someone who cares. That's why I'm here. I had seen enough of orphanages. I had worked with enough organizations that I knew the best place for any child is in their family. And we don't just take them home and drop them off. What we do is we spend a lot of time going to the family and finding out what sent that child to the streets. Was it the influence of peers? Was it poverty at home? And then spend a lot of time working on that issue with the family. Every child that's placed back at home, they follow them until they reach the age of 18 or they finish school. Just to make sure that child has no chance of going back to the streets, everything is fine, they have enough food, they're in school, they invest their lives in these children. I'm sure that these kids, if given a chance and a place to make their lives, for sure they are going to change and make a better generation to come. I just want to sincerely say thank you. It is because of Southern Baptist that I am able to be here. The shelter is able to keep running. I'm able to serve in this way because of your gifts to the Lottie Moon Christmas Offering and the Cooperative Program. And it's miraculous to see a child that was alone living on the streets and hopeless uh, reunited with their family. This is the model that works. This is what helps to get kids back home where they should be and where they want to be. Okay, good morning, boys and girls. Um, this Miss Jennifer here will do our children's message this morning. And uh, last week, we talked about two uh, important things of, of the Christmas season here, one being waiting and the other one being hope. And um, the Lottie Moon video there definitely gives us uh, something to really put um, where we can understand hope, right? So those those boys that are being serviced by those wonderful um, workers there and, and through our gifts um, here many thousand miles away from where that was taking place, you know, they have hope. And, you know, that's um, really a good, 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 something that we can see and uh, help us to understand um, hope this time of year. And, you know, they're hoping and they're waiting every day to get to do those those activities and get to have that that fellow that friendship and that family um, with their um, situation there. But you know, we were talking about hope and waiting last week. Do you guys remember what we said that uh, that we are waiting and hoping for? It was for a person. It's Jesus, right? So that's right. Uh, Jesus is coming, and you know, here at the Christmas season, um, we celebrate the birth of Jesus, and uh, the, think of Jesus as, as a baby, and you know that he was sent here by God, um, and we're also waiting and hoping for Jesus to come again, right? So to come as our Savior and as our Lord, and um, in the Bible. Uh, we talked a little bit last week about prophets and the prophet uh, Isaiah, and, and it was a man that, that God told that Jesus was coming. And, and Isaiah was, um, before the baby Jesus was born here as a, as a man on the earth, Isaiah was here hundreds of years before that. And, you know, God told Isaiah that, that Jesus was coming. And we know that God always keeps his promises, not one time. Has God ever promised to do something that he didn't do it? And, you know, that's kind of, you know, that's really awesome, isn't it? Because as humans, sometimes promises are made but not always kept, but not God. He always keeps his promises. When Isaiah said that Jesus was coming, no one knew exactly who who he was or, or how long it would be before he came to earth because, remember, that was several hundred years that God told Isaiah, and then Isaiah started telling the people, and we talked about that last week also, didn't we? That if we have good news and something that is exciting that we should tell people. And Isaiah started telling people that when Isaiah would talk to people or, or to you know, he'd prophesy, as we would say, he would use words to describe Jesus. And um, some of the words he would use would be wonderful. He might say, mighty everlasting, and uh, finally he used uh, a name for Jesus called the Prince of Peace to describe him. So everyone knew he was going to be awesome. I mean, they didn't know when he was coming. They didn't know what he would look like, but they knew that with those words that Isaiah used to describe him, that Jesus was going to be just awesome, awesome, awesome. 
So um, we're going to look at a Bible verse today, and um, it's from Isaiah, book in the Bible. Remember Isaiah the prophet there, and it comes to us from the ninth chapter of Isaiah, the sixth verse. And this is that um, Bible verse. It says, for to us a child is born. You know, that child is right. It's Jesus. To us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. So it's really important, and and I'm positive that God, Jesus, they want us to start um, memorizing and to be able to hide the words of the Bible in our heart. And as a grown-up even, sometimes it's hard for me to remember um, Bible verses. And, you know, there's some ways that we can help ourselves remember that. And one of the ways that we can do that is to be um, use our bodies to do some motions to help remember the words. And that's a really, really good way for us to help ourselves remember some Bible verses. So we are going to w- learn some motions for Isaiah 9-6. And throughout this Christmas season, and not only during the Christmas season, from now on, you can help remember Isaiah 9-6 by doing these motions. So... I want you guys to be watching. You can do them with me. Grown-ups, you're watching. You can do them with me because, like I said, as a grown-up, I need help with ways to remember Bible verses. So what we're going to do is um, we're going to go through Isaiah 9-6, like a little section at a time, and then add a motion to help our brains help us remember this Bible verse. Okay, are we ready? All right, so the first motion is to point up. So everybody do that. Thank you, Pastor Clay. Good job, Emma. Way to go. And he will be called, we're pointing up to he, he be Jesus, right? And he will be called Wonderful Counselor. And what we're going to do is we're going to clap three times on wonderful because it has three sounds in that word, three syllables, Wonderful Counselor. Okay, let's try that part. Ready? Wonderful Counselor. All right, let's put that together. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor. And the next thing that Isaiah said Jesus would be called was Mighty God. You see that? Mighty means strong, right? So Mighty God. All right, let's put those three parts together. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God. All right, so the next thing that Isaiah said Jesus would be called is Everlasting Father. Do you know how long Everlasting is? If you can think as far back backwards in time as you can and as far forwards in time as you can longer than that everlasting means forever so we're going to like remember as far back and as far forward we're going to stretch our arms out really far everlasting father so let's put those four parts together we ready and he will be called wonderful counselor mighty god everlasting father and then the last thing in isaiah 9 6 uh, Jesus will be called the Prince of Peace, and um, a prince is royalty, and royalty might wear a crown, right? So we're going to act like we're putting the crown on Jesus and say Prince of Peace. Let's try that part. Ready? Prince of Peace. I think we can do it. Let's go the whole thing. Ready? And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and the Prince of Peace. So, you know, the Bible says that Jesus is wonderful. And what does wonderful mean? It means that something is not just good, not just very good. It's as many very, 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 very goods as you could say, right? So Jesus is very, 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 very infinity good. It also says that he's mighty. So we did that part for mighty. Jesus is strong, right? He's extremely powerful and extremely strong. And it says he's the everlasting father. And Jesus has no beginning and no end. And, and, you know, that's kind of hard for us to understand, especially since Jesus came as a baby. And we're like, well, he was born. But Jesus existed before, before, before. He and God have always existed. And they'll never stop existing. So everlasting literally means forever. And um, the Prince of Peace The last part, the Prince of Peace, what does that mean? It means that Jesus will be a leader that brings peace to his people. And that's, you know, his ultimate goal is to bring peace between us and God. And I just think that 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 verse there, Isaiah uh, 9-6, is wonderful. 
and it's something that you can memorize. You could teach. Remember, we're supposed to tell people, teach somebody that. And I think we're going to go through it one more time, and then we'll pray, and Emma will come back up and lead us in a song. All right, here we go. So this is Isaiah 9, 6. See if you guys remember it. Ready? Let's point up where we start. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and the Prince of Peace. And those are all names that uh, we could say for Jesus. And he is definitely all of those things and so much more, isn't he? All right. Let's bow our heads and pray and thank Jesus for this lesson. Dear God and Heavenly Father, we thank you for giving words to people uh, like Isaiah so that we also can learn uh, more about you, Lord. And we thank you for um, that Jesus is all those things, that he is the wonderful counselor. He is the mighty God. He is the everlasting Father, and he is our Prince of Peace, Lord. And we just thank you so much for sending him. We thank you for this Christmas season. And God, um, as we wait and as we hope, Lord, we just we just hope that so many people will learn about you, Lord, and, and that they will learn to put their trust in you, and they will go tell other people too because that's our, our job here, and you want us to do that. And we just thank you for this service today, and we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. over to Pastor Clay.
I have loved you, says the Lord. Yet you say, how have you loved us? In a time where one man stands seemingly alone. We give God the change in our pockets, but keep the best for ourselves. We sit down to a bountiful feast, only to leave God the leftovers. Good morning again. Welcome back to Licking River Baptist Church. We're so excited that you're joining uh, us this morning. Uh, today, we're going to actually continue uh, our study through the book of Malachi. And so today is going to get a little personal. Today is going to get a little sensitive. I want to go ahead and put that out there right now. I've been stuck as I've been going through this week. There, there's been one verse from last week. That, that has really just stuck with me. It's, it's been something uh, difficult, I should say, for, for me I, uh, to, to grip and to come to terms with. And it's not uh, that I can't understand it. It's just one of those gut punch verses. And it comes from last week when we talked about the Lord despising the polluted offerings. And he says, oh, that you would just close the doors lest you kindle a fire on my altar. And it really struck at my heart. And it really kind of, as I studied it last week and as I've tried to get away from it this week, it's just been one of those verses that I keep coming back to and I keep reading and rereading and rereading and rereading. And it's, it talks about our, 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 our truth in worship, our, our reality of, of, of worship. And I am pretty lighthearted. I, I, I tend to try to get along with, with everyone. I think I'm pretty easygoing. I'm, uh, I, I, I don't really cause a lot of conflict, and I don't really start my days. I'm thinking, how can I get ahead today? And in my past, that has been linked to naivety. They say, well, Clay, you're just naive. You're, you just you don't understand the way the world really works. And the fact is, is you can ask my wife, I'm extremely skeptical. Uh, in reality, I'm very skeptical of everything and everybody. Uh, because I've been hurt in the past, and that comes from my hurt in the past. But as I come to think about the position that God has called me into, uh, I, I've, I've just been burning this question in my mind over and over again. Is my worship enough? Is my worship honoring to God? Is my life honoring to worship? In fact, I'll be honest, right before writing this sermon, Brittany and I had a huge fight. Uh, and I think a lot of that carried over into uh, th this. And, and, and so it comes into honoring God with our lives and with our, our worship of Him. And I have to think to myself, is what I do honoring to God? The priest had lost their love of God. They had lost their fear of God. They had basically phoned in their, their worship of God. In fact, when my wife was in college, she wrote a script, a movie script for a class. And I wish that it would have been made. It was called Karaoke Christianity. And what it was, was it was a, about a, a worship band that had lost their first love. They lost their love of God and they had just phoned in their worship. Today, we're going to talk about phoning it in. We're going to talk about our worship with our lives. Is it honoring to God? So if you have your Bibles, I would invite you to open up with me to Malachi chapter 2. Malachi chapter 2, we're going to begin reading in verse 1. Malachi chapter 2, we're going to begin reading in verse 1. God's Word says, And now, O priest, this command is for you. If you will not listen, if you will not take to heart or to give honor to my name, says the Lord of hosts, then I will send a curse upon you. 
and I will curse your blessings indeed. I have already cursed them because you do not lay it to heart. Behold, I will rebuke your offspring and spread dung on your faces, the dung of your offerings, and it shall be taken away with it. So shall you know that I have sent this command to you, that my covenant with Levi may stand, says the Lord of hosts. My covenant with him was once of life and peace, and I gave them to him. It was a covenant of fear, and he feared me. He stood in awe of my name. True instruction was in his mouth, and no wrong was found on his lips. He walked with me in peace and uprightness, for he turned many from iniquity. For the lips of the priest should guard the knowledge, of, and people should seek instruction from his mouth. For he is a messenger of the Lord of hosts. But you have turned aside from the way. You have caused many to stumble by your instruction. You have corrupted the covenant of Levi, says the Lord of hosts. And so I make you despised and abased before all people. And as much as you do not keep my ways, but show partiality in your instruction. Have we not all one father? Has not one God created us? Why then are we faithless to one another? profaning the covenant of our fathers. Judah has been faithless and an abomination has been committed in Israel and in Jerusalem. For Judea has profaned the sanctuary of the Lord. For he loves and he has married the daughter of a foreign god. May the Lord cut off the tents of Jacob and any descendant of the man who does this, who brings an offering to the Lord of hosts. And the second thing you do, you cover the Lord's altar with tears, with weeping and groaning because he no longer regards the offerings or accepts it with favor from your hand. But you say, why does he not? Because the Lord has witnessed between you and your wife of your youth, to whom you have been faithless, though she is your companion and your wife by covenant. Did he not make them one with a portion and a spirit and a union? And what was the one God seeking? Godly offspring. So guard yourselves in spirit. And let none of you be faithless to your wife of your youth. For the man who does not love his wife but divorces her, says the Lord, uh, the God of Israel, covers his garment with violence, says the Lord of hosts. So guard yourselves in spirit and do not be faithless. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for today. God, I thank you, Father, for the opportunity that we have to gather this morning. Lord, I pray that right now, Father, you will take me, you will hide me behind the cross. God, I pray that what is preached today might be what you are speaking, God. Nothing of what Clay can say, nothing of what Clay can talk about, Father. I pray that what today you are doing is you are speaking to people's hearts. God, many of us have lost our true love of worship. And God, I pray that today, or we might see your fascinating and wonderful worship. So, Father, we love you and we thank you. We pray all these things in your son Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. In college, I remember studying a fellow, and I became fascinated with his story. His name was Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, and he was a poet and a professor, and in his own way, a a semi-theologian. And so he was born in 1807, and Henry was raised in Portland, Massachusetts, and later, after his schooling, he became a professor at Cambridge. On July 9th, 1861, Fanny, or Francis Longfellow, was sealing some envelopes with wax when suddenly her dress caught fire. Henry was sleeping and was awakened by the screaming and rushed to his wife's aid to throw first of a small area rug, which did nothing, and finally to use his own body to diminish the flames. However, the burns were too severe and she passed away. Henry was severely burned as well and, and, and wrote and became mad with grief. With the distant rumbles of war, the now widowed man of six was distraught when his oldest rode off into battle of the Civil War. In November of 1863, Henry received word uh, that his oldest son was critically wounded in battle. And so having gone through all of that on December 24th, 1863, Henry looked at the world around him and didn't recognize it and he penned these words that many of us might have read while we were in school i heard the bells on christmas day their old familiar carols play the wild and sweet the words repeat of peace on earth goodwill toward men 
and thought how, as the day had come, the belfries of all Christendom had rolled along the unbroken song of peace on earth, goodwill towards men, till ringing, singing on its way, the world revolved from night to day, a voice, a chime, a chant sublime of peace on earth, goodwill towards men. Then from each black accursed mouth the cannon thundered in the south with the sound the carols drowned of peace on earth, goodwill towards men. It was as if an earthquake rent the hearth stones of a continent and made forlorn the the households born of peace on earth, goodwill towards men. And in despair I bowed my head, for there is no peace on earth, I said, For hate is strong and mocks the song of peace on earth, goodwill towards men. Then pealed the bells more loud and deep. God is not dead, nor doth he sleep. The right or the wrong shall fail, and the right prevail with peace on earth and goodwill towards men. That poem written in 1863 rings hold a lot of truth today. Because in today's society, we face a lot of hate. We face a lot of division. We face a lot of what they were facing within the Civil War. But this last stanza he penned, I think, speaks volumes into what we need to understand today. God is not dead, nor doth he sleep. The wrong shall fail. The right prevail. Folks, I don't know about you. But I've seen the end of this book. And there is great victory in Jesus. God is not dead, nor does he sleep. But we treat him so often as if he does. Look with me in Malachi chapter 2. It says, And now, O priest, this command is for you. Uh, If you will not listen, if you have not taken to heart or to give honor to my name, says the Lord of hosts, then I will send the curse upon you, and I will curse your blessings. Indeed, I have already cursed them. Because you do not lay it to heart. Malachi drops these accusations and begins speaking directly to the priest. He says, if you will not listen, if you will not take heart, I will curse on your blessings. The word here is Shema. And this is where the Jewish prayer comes from. It says, hear me. Listen to me. The, the, The Jewish prayer of hear, O Israel, the Shema begins, hear me, listen to me, understand what I am saying to you, pay attention to what I am saying. The emphasis is not on the listening part, but on the hearing part. Those of you that have ever dealt with teenagers, you know there's a difference. Teenagers can listen, but can they hear? There's a huge difference. Curse, uh, he says, I will send a cursing Of the blessings. And this is a a very rare word here. In fact, it only recurs one other time in Scripture. The word is Mireya, which means curse, which means to have the only other occurrence is in Deuteronomy 28, where God lays out the curses for disobedience. Therefore, it's tied into their blessings, into their offerings. Their lives were to be cursed. They didn't love God. So the thought then process would then be, then why then does God love them and the answer is because he is god amen because he is god look here in verse three behold i will rebuke your offspring and spread dung on your faces the dung of your offerings and i shall be taken away with it i will rebuke your offering i will take i will turn away from it i won't acknowledge it this was a serious offense in Jewish culture, because your offering was your clemency. Your offering was what you used to, to, to pardon your sins. And God said, I will no longer pardon your sins. I will no longer, I will separate myself from you. But listen to this. He says, I will spread dung on your face. All right, let's talk about this verse. <laughs> I will admit, this verse we have to understand culturally. I have made the mistake very early on in my ministry uh, to go through this book with with youth and not to explain it culturally. We have to understand culturally what this meant. The disgrace of such gross sins committed by the serving of, of ministry in the land 
came from this, came from, from them cheating of God's word. We have to understand this in a farming culture. Their, their farming, their offerings were, were worth of nothingness. And we have to understand that this word here, this word dung, typically we, 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 we define it quite differently. Just put it that way. But dung was typically what was left over after the offering. Now, when you offered something, you offered your prized animal, your prized lamb, your prized ram, your prized animal, and there would have been leftovers, the entrails, the disgusting parts of the body. And so there was leftovers. And so this was the dung that was to be spread. It was the entrails of animals which had remained after the sacrifice. It was to be smeared on their faces. Don't miss this point. Making them unclean. It was to be spread on the priest, not as an insult, but to make them unclean. They're saying, not only will I not accept your offering, but I will then make you unclean. Which in Jewish customs, in Israelistic customs, would have been a complete and utter casting out of. You were unclean, therefore you were untouchable. You were unsociable. You were unemployable. You were unblankety blank blankable. He made them unclean. Wednesday, we talked about Moses being commanded to take his sandals off because the Holy Land, because his sandals were unclean. And we talked about how Jesus takes our sin sandals off. That was such a weird phrase. So that we might be made clean. The, the dung that was spread on the, on the priests would have made them unclean. They were so worried with appearances that they missed devotion. They were so worried about what they looked like that they missed the entire point of what they were doing. I will say this for COVID. I think COVID has taught a lot of churches that legalism is just that. That, that, that worship can occur without legalism. And I, and, I, and I will for one say that I love that. I love that, that COVID is teaching us that we get caught up sometimes so much in traditionalism that we forget why we had that tradition in the first place. It makes us remember why we do the things we do. Look here in verse 4. It says, So shall you know that I have sent this command to you that my covenant with Levi may stand, says the Lord of hosts. My covenant with him was one of life and peace. And I gave them to him. It was a covenant of fear. And he feared me. He stood in all of my name. True instruction was in his mouth. And no wrong was found on his lips. He walked with me in peace and uprighteousness. And he turned many from iniquity. For the lips of the priests should guard knowledge of the people. They should seek instruction from his mouth. For he is the messenger of the Lord of hosts. God is once again trying to help them understand that their actions have led others astray. That our actions sometimes lead others astray. And we don't quite understand that sometimes. In fact, sometimes we, we get a little confused about why it, it, it happens. But realistically, I want you to hear this. Our hearts, our, our, our worship should be focused not on the, 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 the things we do, but the person that we do it for. That's why we spent so long before we partook of the Lord's Supper together, going through why we even do it. Because so often we get so caught up in that little wafer and that small cup of grape juice that we forget why on earth we do it. And I can tell you how I know that. Because teenagers don't know why we do it. Folks, if we don't know why we do it, we can't expect our children to. We cannot expect the ones who are coming up after that, the one that God is raising up after us. We cannot expect them to know why we do it. We're so caught up in traditionalism as an American church today that we completely forget why we do things. Their actions were worthless. And finally, it says the, leaves, the, 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 the lips of the priest should, should, should guard knowledge. If the priests are not holding the knowledge of good and evil, who is? They, that was their job. That was what God charged them with. And they weren't even listening. Verse 8 says, But you have turned aside from the way. 
You have caused many to stumble by your by your instruction. You have corrupted the covenant of Levi, says the Lord of hosts. He says you have turned away. The priests have moved beyond what God intends for them. They, they moved on and, and they started doing things that were going uh, that were that were things that didn't need to be done. The priests moved beyond what God had intended for them and were leading people astray. And so in verse 9, it says, So I make you despised and abased before the people. And as much as you do not keep my ways, but show partiality in your instruction. Their partiality was beneficial to them. Their partiality was saying that I know better. Here, here's, the, here's the problem, church. The priests had completely forgotten about their love of God. They would completely forgot about their worship for God. They were phoning it in. They were saying, how could I make myself look holy and make as much money as possible? You know, in those days, a prized lamb or a prized ram that would have been offered could have gotten you a lot of money. It could have gotten you a wife. It could have, got, it could have been traded for so many goods that were needed. But here's the thing, church. They had so forgotten what God had done for them. We are so far removed from the Exodus that the Israelites have completely forgot what God had done for them. What God had, had, had been through them. These priests were so concerned about me that they missed Him. They show partiality in their instruction. They were teaching the new generation how God wasn't important. Church, be warned. If God is not important in your life, there is no way he will be important in your kids' lives. There is no way that he will be important in those that follow, that look to use lives. Church, if God is not important in your life, then we have no hope of showing people how important he really is. Because we say to ourselves, well, you know what, Clay? That's all great and all, but I've got a life to live. I've got this over here, and I've got this over here, and I've got this over here, and I've got this over here. Clay, we run all day long. Clay, by the time we get home, I just need a few minutes for myself. I'm not the one you have to convince of this. God is. But I can tell you that what I see is disturbing. In fact, one day, I hope to eventually go through all of these. But did you know that statistically, statistically, the likelihood of your child remaining in church beyond high school is very dim. Your child remaining, in, 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 not even in this church, in any church, in any church in America, is very dim. Folks, we are seeing almost a 70% flee rate of our high schoolers after high school. After they graduate from youth group, they move on. And you know the reason is? I'm going to tell you. It's going to hurt. It's going to sting. And I'm apologizing right now. It's not the church's fault. It's because parents aren't showing them the importance of church. Because parents aren't investing in their lives. Statistically, statistically, I'm going to give you two statistics here. Statistically, if your mother is involved in church, if your mother is involved and engaged in church, then your child is 30% more likely to stay after high school. If your father is involved and engaged in church, that number jumps to almost 60%. Think about that, church. If you show your, your, your kids how important church is, how important your worship is, how important your daily devotion is, and instill something inside of them. But the problem is, is we've, for far too long, we've not. And that's why next year we're challenging us to read our Bible every single day. It's important. It's not because Clay wants to be mean. It's because I want our kids to know that God is important. God is worth five minutes of our day. God is worth five minutes of our day. Verse 10 says, Have we not all one Father? Has 
not one God created us? Why then are we faithless to one another, profaning the covenant of our fathers? Judah has been faithless and an abomination has been committed in Israel and in Jerusalem for Judah, uh, for Judah has profaned the sanctuary of the Lord where he loves and has married the daughter of a foreign God. May the Lord cut off the tents of Jacob and his, any descendants of man who does this and who brings an offering to the Lord of hosts. We are under one father and we should put him first. But we show partiality by saying, God, you could sit here during Christmas. God, you could sit here during Easter. Father, God, you can sit here while I'm going through trials in my lives. But the rest of the time, God, this is my throne. This is mine. God, you can sit over in the corner and I will call you when I need you. Might be a little bit of an exaggeration, but this is exactly how we treat God. This is exactly why it's so important to teach kids why God is so important. Because this is what we're seeing. And you say, Clay, how do you know this? Because I taught teenagers. Teenagers so often reflect their parents. And what I see in our rising teens is a complete and utter disregard of God. God is a genie. God is only there for when you need Him. But the rest of the time, you're in control. God, you can sit here during portions of my life, but this is my throne. Finally, our worship needs to extend into our lives, into our everyday lives, into our everyday relationships. Look with me in verse 13. It says, the second thing you do, you cover the Lord's altar with tears, with weeping and groaning, because he no longer regards the offering or accepts it with favor from your hand. We cover the Lord's altar in tears, but we don't want change. We say, God, I'm so sorry. But I'm going to do the same thing tomorrow. I'm going to do the same thing next week. God, I'm really sorry. But I'm going to keep doing it. <laughs> I'm about to get personal. I'm about to get all up in your business. Luckily for me, we're virtual, so you can just click away. But I ask you to hear me out before you click that big X button. We have to be sure that we're not showing God partiality in our lives. Verse 14, it says, but you say, why does, does he not? They're asking, why? Why is God not accepting our offering? But because the Lord has witnessed between you and the wife of your youth to whom you have been faithless, though she is your companion and your wife by covenant. Did he not make them one with a portion of the spirit in their union? And what was the God seeking? Godly offering. So guard yourselves in spirit and let no one, uh, I'm sorry, let none of you be faithless to the wife of your youth. For the man who does not love his wife but divorces her, says the Lord, the God of Israel covers his garment with violence. And the Lord of hosts, so guard yourselves in spirit and do not be faithless. We give God partiality in our home life. We give God partiality in our marriages. We give God partiality in our relationships. We give God partiality in our child rearing. We give God partiality in our incomes. We give God partiality in every aspect of our lives. You know, honestly, I wished I had a mirror because right now I just need to put it right in front of me. We show God partiality by not including Him in our marriages. So often today, I see people getting married out of lust, not out of love. So often today, I see people disregarding God in all of their marriages. We, we cannot begin to understand love without God. I know right now somebody's already offended, but hear me. Marriage, as often I hear this, is not 50-50. <laughs> I've always said, in fact, if you're only given 50% of yourself, it will fail. Those of you that have ever had a spouse, you know that's true. Marriage causes you to abandon yourself. 
The Bible tells us that we, are, we, we leave each other and we become one. And the reason is, is because you give 100% of yourself to that person and they give 100% of themselves to you through God. But realistically, you give 100% of yourselves to God and God draws you closer together. I think the reason that we're seeing Christian marriage reflect the world's divorce rate is quite frankly, we've taken God out of our relationships. We've taken God out of our marriages. We might both go to church, but unless God is the center point of our marriage, it's not your spouse. It's God. Eventually, that spouse is going to fail you. They're going to let you down in some way. Maybe they forgot to unload the dishwasher. Maybe because of some childhood drama, Brittany, they can't even load the dishwasher. I can't, I can't load the dishwasher. I have childhood trauma of it. But eventually, that person will fail you. And unless you have a center point of God to understand what God's love was, as God looks at us, it says every single day, clay. How could you mess up again? But God sits there and says, Clay, come on, buddy. We got to get through this together. We got to go through this together. Does that mean you're never angry at your spouse? Does that mean you ever stop loving your spouse? No. But we've taken so much out of out of, our, out of our relationships. God has been taken so far out of our relationships that we reflect the world too much. Our spouses will let us down, but God never will. We cannot show partiality in our marriages. We cannot show partiality in our relationships with our children. We cannot show partiality with our relationships with one another. If you come in here on Sunday mornings, you have your, 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 your people that you sit with, and you love sitting with them. But you say to yourselves, have you seen them? Oh, who's that family that just walked in back there? What is he wearing? Can't believe he would wear that to church. Your heart is not in the right place. We're going to understand through the book of Malachi, the condition of our heart reflects our worship. If our heart is wicked, our worship is wicked. I want you to understand this. For the man who does not love his wife but divorces her, says the Lord God of Israel, cover his garments with violence. So says the Lord of hosts, guard yourselves in spirit and do not be faithless. Hear me. Hear me clearly. This is an issue I have struggled with for a long time. Many of you know I come from divorced parents. Many of you know that, that maybe some of you have, have, have dealt with divorce can I say this? God hates divorce. But I also serve a God that is forgiving, that is ever loving. That no matter what you've done, no matter what decisions have made in your lives, no matter what outcomes have come in your lives, he sits there and he says, Clay, come with me. I will give you healing. Clay, join with me. I will give you peace. Clay, join together with me because I have the strength when you do not. Divorce is not the end. Divorce is part of a past. And Jesus Christ comes alongside of you and says, I love you. God never lets us down. God never ends his love. And we have to understand if you've ever had divorce affect your lives, you know the toll that it can take I know several people who have had divorce in their lives, and I need you to understand this, this idea of hate. As much like we talked about, God loves the marriage so much that everything else in regards to everything else is hate. God loves so much everything that is happening in your lives. And God has the ability to get you past it, to get you through it, and to get you on the other side of it. 
you know, personally, I stand here and I, I understand. I understand being hurt. I understand being broken. And I think sometimes it's God breaking us that he builds us back up stronger than we ever were before. I trust a God who gives second chances and thirds and fourths. And God, right now, I think I'm on 7,030 seconds. Because that's how many times God has had to forgive me. I trust a God who cannot show partiality toward us, even though we show partiality toward him. I'll show a God who my life is so ingrained in, who I owe so much. Understand this, when God's radicalness is in you, you can no longer just be ordinary anymore because God works through you to do extraordinary things. I have seen countless people radically transformed by God. But we cannot show partiality in our lives. We cannot tell God he can remain there one day, but be gone the next. We have to understand that the radical transformation that happens, what Jesus talks about, is a radical transformation, is a constant, it is a continual. Are there days where they'll be better than others? Yes, but it is a continual transformation that happens in our lives. Don't you want that today? Maybe you're here today and you've never experienced that radical transformation before. Can I tell you today that God loves you? No matter what your past is, no matter what you've had going on in your lives, can I tell you today that God loves you? Maybe you're here today and you're saying, well, Clay, you know, that's all great. That is all good. But realistically, Clay, let's talk about realism here. How can God love me because of all that I have done? We say to ourselves, it is because of the blood of Jesus that we can even begin to understand love. It is because of the spirit that he puts in us that we can even begin to understand love because that man loved you so much that even the worst thing you've ever done in your lives, he looked directly at you and he said, Clay, you are worthy. You are worth it. It's nothing that we have done for ourselves, but it is through the grace of God through the blood of Jesus, that we are forgiven. And there's nothing that we've earned. Can I tell you today that He is looking for you. He is looking to radically transform your life. Maybe you're here today, and you've been a Christian for several years, but if we're honest today, if we are honest today, we say, God, I've shown partiality to you. God, I can't, I, I can't admit today that you have been my first. God, I can't admit today that you are the most important thing in my life because my dog, my ATM card, my bank account, whatever it might be that has circumvented itself is there. Can I tell you today that God is still there. God has never left you. You have never left God. He's still there for you. Make an effort today. To rededicate yourself to putting him first. Maybe you're here today and God has put something on your heart. Whatever it might be. Can I urge you today? Let us know. Here in a moment we're going to have a time of invitation. And during that time. If God is speaking in your life. If God is, is working in you. I want to know about it. You can send us a message here on Facebook. You can go to our website, lrbcstyersville.com And click the respond button. If there's something that God is laying on your heart. If he has called you to salvation, if he has called you to repentance, if he's calling you into missions, whatever it might be, I want to know about it so I can be praying for you and alongside of you. Here in a moment, we're going to have a time of invitation. And I pray that God is speaking to you today. Father God, we thank you for today. Lord, I thank you that you work in our lives, that you do all things, Lord, so that God, when we see your life, God, when we experience your goodness. Lord, I pray that, Father, God, you show us your mercy. Lord, I pray, Father, if there's someone here today that has never experienced the radical transforming that you offer, God, I pray that right now, God, even, even as they think they are unworthy, Father, I pray that you are speaking to them and that you are speaking to them by name and telling them, I love you. And God, I pray that, Father, Lord, we as we look forward to what we are doing through our Christmas season of having hope 
that, God, you are speaking hope into people's lives, Father. If there's someone here, they are hurting. God, they are in need of, of, of prayer. God, they are in need of, of assistance. God, I pray that you wrap your arms around them today. Lord, I pray that, Father, they might know that, God, they are loved. God, not just by you, but by us. And, Lord, I pray that, Father, Lord, as we begin our invitational, that, God, you are speaking. God, I pray people might hear the words of Emma, but God, I pray they might hear the words of you louder. Father, we love you. And we thank you. We pray all these things in your son Jesus' name. Amen. Wanderer, come home. What a beautiful, beautiful message. Because we are all wanderers. And I hope one day God will show you you have a home. Amen. Thank you so much for being here today. I want to thank Jen Stewart for running the broadcast back there. She did a fantastic job. Uh, so, Rondell being in Atlanta, she just did a fantastic job. I'll, I'll give her, uh, I'll give her a clap there. She did a, she did a wonderful, wonderful job. Um, but it has been wonderful with you today. I hope that you've heard nothing that I've said in any kind of malice or, or anything. I believe God is the God of forgiveness. Jesus Christ, through His shed blood on the cross, covers all. So. It's been a rough week. I'm just going to be honest. Satan has tried hard to discourage. And I know if he's discouraging me, he's discouraging others. And I want to speak to you for a moment, church family, and let you know that God tries to or that Satan tries to discourage us by convincing us that God is not who he says he is. His word is not what it says it is, and that his plan is not what it says it is. If you missed Sunday school, please go and watch it. Because I think it's encouraging for us to remember that Jesus faced these exact same temptations. Jesus faced these exact same temptations as, as he went through life. Can I tell you today that I'm glad you're here? And if you're a member of Licking River Baptist Church, I'm glad you're a member. And if you're not, I'm glad you're here. I love you guys. As we depart today, remember to worship God in our tithes and our offerings. Uh, remember, you can give at lrbcsalyersville.com. You can scroll down, hit the Give button. Or, if you want to, you can mail your checks to K, as you always can, uh, and you always have been able to. Uh, but I want you to know, as we go through our, uh, our, our time together, we'll be watching our community closely over the next couple days, and we'll be making a decision uh, very soon, about probably Thursday or Friday, on whether or not we will be meeting in person on Sunday. And again, if we do meet in person on Sunday, I'm going to ask a couple of the ladies on Saturday to help me decorate the church. And so uh, we are our sanctuary where we are blessed that we can social distance. Everybody takes three windows, then, you know, 15, 20 minutes, we should be done. 
uh, but it should be a good time for us to uh, be able to get together to decorate our sanctuary and to uh, hopefully look forward to regathering on the 13th. Uh, but again, we're going to keep a close eye on what our community looks like. I've, uh, we've kind of, it's just what it is. And so I love you guys. Know that. And I'm here for you. If you guys need anything, please don't hesitate to reach out. Let us know how we can be praying for you. Let us know how we can be coming alongside of you. Let us know what we can be doing for you. Remember our December devotional and be sure you read it with your family. I love you guys and I hope you guys have a fantastic day. We'll see you guys on Wednesday.